Hello, my name is Ethan Fan, and I will be presenting on the effect of tamoxifen on the management of female lower urinary tract conditions. I have no disclosures. Tamoxifen is commonly used for treatment and adjuvant therapy of estrogen receptor positive breast cancers. Categorized as a selective estrogen receptor modulator, or SERM, tamoxifen binds to estrogen receptors and acts as an agonist in some tissues and antagonist in others. Vaginal atrophy typically occurs with postmenopausal women as they have decreased amounts of estrogen. Vaginal estrogen is thus typically used for treatment of symptoms or complications of vaginal atrophy. Urologically, this can include urinary tract infections or UTIs, urinary incontinence or UI, and pelvic organ prolapse or POP. However, in a patient with breast cancer, Vaginal estrogen is avoided due to the fear of systemic absorption, which could increase the risk of recurrence of an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Guidelines by ACOG recommend the use of non hormonal treatments as first line for treatment of urogenital symptoms in patients with a history of breast cancer. Current knowledge on the long term management of UTIs, UI, and POP in patients with a history of tamoxifen use is extremely limited. It is unknown if tamoxifen affects the vagina such that it impacts the success rate of non-hormonal medical and surgical interventions. There is also a lack of knowledge regarding the development of side effects affecting the lower urinary tracts from tamoxifen. Thus, the goal of this study was to review the efficacy of non-estrogen management for UTIs, urinary incontinence, and pelvic organ prolapse in women with current or previous tamoxifen exposure to determine if such exposure influenced their management outcome. We conducted a retrospective chart review on women who had a current or previous history of tamoxifen exposure and were referred to our female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery tertiary care clinic from 2015 to 2020. Patients were excluded from analysis of their review for referral did not include UTIs, urinary incontinence, or pelvic organ prolapse, and a follow-up after management was less than six months. Successful treatment was determined with various measurements. For UTIs, Treatment was successful if the rate of UTIs after treatment was less than two UTIs in six months or three within a year. Uh, this is the cutoff for current UTIs. For those undergoing electrofulguration, success was also predicated on a six-month post-fulguration office cystoscopy, showing the complete resolution of superficially cauterized lesions and no appearance of new inflammatory lesions in the bladder. Urinary incontinence treatment outcomes were based on the short forms of validated symptom questionnaires, the Urinary Distress Inventory, or UDI-6, and Incontinence Impact Questionnaire, or IIQ-7. Based on a study by Skorupska, response was marked as successful if the questionnaire total scores during follow-up visits were less than those prior to treatment, the UDI-6 total score was less than 33.33 post-treatment, the IIQ7 total score was less than 9.52 post-treatment, and the follow-up notes did not record any abnormal physical examination findings or surgical complications. Response to treatment for POP was noted on physical examination and prolapse quantification or POPQ staging. Uh, success was marked if there was improvement uh, to prolapse stage 0 or 1 after treatment, and there were no complaints of symptoms, such as vaginal bulge, from the patient. 32 out of 41 patients with tamoxifen exposure met study criteria. 9 were referred for UTIs, 10 for UI, 8 for POP, 1 for both UTIs and UI, and 4 for both UI and POP. Those excluded either were referred for alternate conditions, such as urethral pain and vaginal discharge, or for having insufficient follow-up. Regarding the tamoxifen history, all patients took a dose of 10 to 20 milligrams of tamoxifen daily, with one patient taking 40 milligrams daily over the course of a median of four years. 28 patients out of the 32 in the study were no longer in tamoxifen at the time of data extraction, with 26 in remission from breast cancer. Of the 10 patients referred for UTIs, five were started on daily prophylactic medications, including low-dose antibiotics, d and or hyper. Two were given self-start antibiotics, and three were prescribed antibiotics with culture-proven infections. Three patients with extensive lesions of chronic trigonitis, uh, recurrent UTI episodes, and no response to multiple antibiotic courses elected to undergo superficial electrofulguration, with adequate subsequent healing and no recurrence of cystitis on cystoscopy at six months. On workup, no patients had any underlying urologic conditions, 
that increase the risk of UTIs, such as reflex or retention. And all UTI patients showed improvement of symptoms, as well as no incidence of pyelonephritis, sepsis, and hospitalizations for UTIs at a median follow-up of one year. Of 15 patients referred for urinary incontinence, 10 chose intervention, all of whom had no incontinence recurrence at a median follow-up of 2.5 years. Four opted for surgical interventions based on stress UI severity by UDS findings and degree of prolapse by examination. Two patients with primarily urge incontinence were prescribed uh, medications, oxybutynin and or mirobegron. Uh, four underwent uh, pelvic floor physical therapy along with behavioral uh, bladder modifications. The remaining five urinary incontinence patients decided to pursue only behavioral modifications, three reporting a decrease in symptoms, and two no change at six months or more. Except for one treated with a pessary, all POP patients underwent surgical procedures with satisfactory outcomes on physical examination, uh, including the POPQ, at a uh, median follow-up of three years. Seven procedures were performed vaginally, including anterior vaginal wall suspension, rectal seal repair, and or complete prolapse repair. Four were open or robotic mesh repairs by sacrocopalpexy, two of which were post-hysterectomy. Despite the lack of estrogen use in these patients, their respective treatment for UTIs, UI, and POP produced satisfactory outcomes, consistent with data in women not exposed to tamoxifen and benefiting from estrogen supplementation. Although direct comparison of outcomes with similar treatment modalities for each condition is not possible due to our limited sample size, all of our postmenopausal women in the study experienced symptomatic improvement at a minimum of six months follow-up. Therefore, treatment of these conditions can still be favorable and should not be denied to these women on the basis of their tamoxifen exposure and inability to use vaginal estrogens.